Welcome everyone. We're very excited to have you joining us today. I'm Judine Preddy and I'm the director of the WorkLearn Institute at the University of Waterloo. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you today from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people, and I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors past and present. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. I also acknowledge that while coming together today, while staying apart, we are gathering on other traditional lands across the country. I acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we all share these lands today. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers joining us today. We have Dr. Besma Momani, a full professor of political science at the University of Waterloo, a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, and a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, DC. Welcome, Besma. We also have Jeff Wentworth, co-founder of CurveGrid, a blockchain SaaS startup based in Tokyo, Japan. CurveGrid has been recruiting Waterloo Co-op students remotely from their office in Japan since 2018, and they recently won the first ever CEE Employer Award for International Impact in International Excellence Impact. Welcome, Jeff. We also have Katie Evansik, a 30, third year recreation and sport business co-op student from the University of Waterloo. Katie is a varsity athlete and has completed two out of her five co-op terms. She'll be beginning a one-year contract with Scotiabank as a campus recruiter in human resources beginning in May 2021. Welcome, Katie. And we also have with us Matthew Olson, a fourth year arts and business co-op student from the University of Waterloo. Matthew is entering his fourth and final year of studies and is currently on a work term as a business development coordinator for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Welcome, Matthew. Many of you joining us today are probably quite familiar with the University of Waterloo. This slide highlights just a few of the things that make Waterloo and our co-op programs quite unique. The newly named Work Learn Institute at the University of Waterloo does work in these three areas, and we're proud to be the host of this Future Ready Workforce series. The first event today highlighting the recruitment phase and subsequent events highlighting other stages of the talent development cycle. And now what my guests and I are here to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about recruiting an equitable and diverse workforce, about attracting the right candidates, and about strengthening your remote recruitment strategies. Let's dive in. A white paper that the WorkLearn Institute published in the fall of 2020 was a synthesis of many reports and predictions on the future of work. In our analysis, we identified six main themes related to the future of work. One of those themes was the importance of fostering cultures of equity, diversity, and inclusion. This slide includes a number of statistics that highlight the importance of a focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion for organizations as they prepare for the changes ahead. Beyond the moral and ethical reasons for organizations to foster cultures of equity, diversity, and inclusion, these numbers indicate that as organizations compete for talent, it will be more important than ever before to review recruitment practices to ensure that they are not overlooking an untapped potential in the labor market. We see examples from our co-op employers who are attracting a broader pool of applicants by casting a wider net on the level or program of the student they wish to hire. We also see this in the diversity and inclusion statements included in co-op job postings. Although a recent analysis of more than 78,000 job postings found that less than 4% of those postings included such a statement in the co-op job posting despite many employers telling us that they would like to raise their organization's profile with underrepresented groups. 
For those of you who have been involved in this work for a long time, it won't be surprising to you to see these findings. Organizations who focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion during recruitment are more likely to be innovative, to anticipate change, and to meet or exceed financial targets. We've also heard this from co-op employers who tell us that some of their most significant breakthroughs or accomplishments are attributed to employees who were able to bring their unique perspectives and experiences to the table. One note of caution, however, a study done at the University of Waterloo highlighted the importance of following through on recruitment promises. It's not sufficient to convey to potential applicants the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion to your organization only for them to become part of a team or a department whose culture does not align with those promises. I'd now like to turn things over to Dr. Momani, who's going to talk about some key areas to consider in incorporating equity, diversity, and inclusion in the hiring process. Besma? Thank you, Jadine, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about how do we get recruitment that is diverse into our workplace? And it is really a, a, a difficult task. I think one thing we need to start off with is diversity is hard. Um, getting a diverse workplace is hard. And knowing that is really important because I think it, it really sets us up for success when you know that it's actually a challenge. Uh, we know that people like to hire like themselves. Um, we can call it many different things. It is just a reality. But it's important to know that to get a diverse workforce, you have to look at how you actually recruit. And so think about this in terms of having um, anything from blind recruitment, which is this idea that we uh, invite people to submit CVs and resumes without their name, without certain signifiers. Um, that can be scrubbed very easily today as we're receiving more and more of our CVs and, and uh, resumes online. Uh, you can, of course, train uh, your employees, your HR to uncover unconscious biases. It's really important to say that everybody has unconscious biases, so you can't go into this thinking, oh, I'm not biased. Really important. Using diverse recruitment teams. Uh, this has been shown to be really important. You can't um, sometimes uh, overcome those biases. So having a diverse recruitment team is really important. And also thinking about things like uh, how to overcome uh, limitations of Canadian experience. We'll talk about that in a couple of, uh, a couple of slides as well. And I'd like to talk about as well, thinking about how uh, we also want to look at foreign education. We know a lot of immigrants that come to this country really do feel that their foreign experience is often not you know, recognized. Uh, that's a shame because we know as, as many companies today are uh, thinking about exporting, expanding globally, uh, those are your really valuable interlocutors to help you uh, take advantage of all the great opportunities that are out there. But thinking about that is really important in the way we look at a foreign degree. Uh, sometimes we don't know that, for example, this person came from, you know, the equivalent of the Harvard from China, for example. Knowing a little more about the credentialing of foreign uh, graduates is really great. We've got a lot of work to do at the government, regulatory and business side of things to think about, you know, how to translate foreign credentials into Canadian ones. All of that, I think, is really important in our understanding of what it is that is really kind of um, almost to our detriment, not taking advantage of a really important latent force uh, in our workforce. The other thing that I think we can you know, discuss is, is looking at um, uh, you know, language fluency. Uh, often employers say it's not just that my you know, prospective employee, particularly immigrants, might not have English or French, but they might not have also, uh, frankly, the professional fluency, you know, how to do business in Canada. So think about this, if you're going to really want to achieve diversity in your workplace and you think this is a real challenge to you, then think about offering courses. Think about offering the kinds of upgrading of skills and it can be very, very uh, much managed in you know, a very short period of time where you have a workplace directed language training that allows, uh, frankly, particularly immigrants to think about ways of uh, really applying their great skills to your particular industry and workforce. Thanks, Besma. Those are all excellent ideas and, and strategies. I'd now like to ask Jeff Wentworth to talk about what diversity means to his organization, Curve Grid. Thank you, uh, Judine. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Jeff Wentworth. I'm the co-founder of Curve Grid, and we are a software company. 
uh, based in uh, Tokyo, Japan, with uh, some some fairly strong uh, ties to Canada. So I'm coming at this from the perspective of a co-op employer, uh, from the perspective of an international co-op employer, and one that that is is based outside of Canada. Um, so I think you know fundamentally, uh, a diverse organization is just good business, right? It just makes good business sense. Um, the more diverse our team is, the better decisions we make. Uh, the more that we avoid a uh, groupthink and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, bring new perspectives to uh, business uh, problems and challenges, uh, not only internally but also for our customers as well. It's 2021. Our customers are global and diverse. Whether you know we're a, a Japanese technology company or a technology uh, or a company that's that's based in Canada, uh, and we we really need to have a team that can connect with those customers in the way that uh, um, um, you know they want to be uh, serviced. So I think that's that's very uh, very important and um, you know something that that drives our thinking on this. Uh, but diversity requires work. And this is something that uh, Dr. Momani uh, touched on uh, briefly as well, right? And especially for us in the technology field, we're really uh, going up against a uh, very um, uh, homogenous uh, status quo. Um, one of the strategies that we um, that that we um, that we use, of course, is starting with a as diverse a candidate pool as possible. And the University of Waterloo, other universities in general, have been a very very good source of uh, a diverse set of candidates for us. It's really a cross section of, um, uh, you know, when you look at Canada, for example, a very a cross section of a, a diverse uh, society. And, uh, you know, even given that, you know, we certainly do everything that we can uh, to evaluate uh, uh, the candidate pool um, on a broad range of uh, factors. So, you know, Dr. Momami talked about some of the, the sorts of uh, things you can do almost like a double blind uh, um, a kind of approach to that. Uh, we do things like uh, uh, um, we do automated uh, coding tests that are both uh, evaluated. Um, uh, um, uh, coding means programming. Value uh, automated programming tests for our software engineer uh, candidates. They're evaluated both by machine. Then we also look at those um, uh, 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 separately as well. Um, we also are very very uh, careful to look at all of the other factors, whether it's a resume. Did the candidate uh, reach out to us individually? Uh, what are their their other um, uh, you know other other kinds of um, uh, factors in their their cover letter? Um, we we're we're always certain to have at least a couple of different uh, discussions with with each candidate, um, uh, with with different team members, and making sure that that the team members that are are are, are uh, speaking with them um, are also uh, um, uh, you know bringing uh, diverse uh, perspectives as well. Um, I think that the, the last piece here is playing to the organization's strengths, right? And uh, for us, uh, you know, we're able to uh, recruit very qualified talent, partly because uh, we are in Japan and, you know, it's, it's uh, um, uh, let's say there's some opportunities uh, um, uh, uh, to bring candidates here, certainly, you know, maybe not in the past year. Um, but I think that um, for Canadian organizations as well, um, recruiting remotely is almost uh, and, and, and globally has almost never been easier in the sense that you, uh, you know, there's talent that you can you can access uh, kind of, you know, from anywhere in the globe. So I think that, um, you know, for all of these reasons, we really believe very strongly that a diverse organization is a stronger organization. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Katie. Now that we've talked about the importance of equity and diversity in the recruitment phase, can you share a little bit about your experience and how uh, organizations can get, convey to potential applicants the importance they place on equity, diversity, and inclusion? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Judine. So yeah, my name is Katie. I'm in my third year at the University of Waterloo. And after having quite a bit of job experience so far, I've really seen quite a few different types of applications from different companies. And a big thing that definitely stands out to me is when a company not only has a highly diverse staff, but that they have stats to back it up within the job application. So there have been times where I've seen on applications that they have 25% of their staff are people of color or 52% are women. And those are things that definitely draw an applicant like myself to want to work in an organization 
like Jeff mentioned earlier, groupthink does happen. And when you have different people with different experiences and backgrounds coming together to work on collaborative projects, you definitely have a better result than if you have all like-minded people sitting in the same room. So I like terminology in group and job applications that promote that they are not only supportive to diversity, but they're also practicing it. So talking about inclusion in the workplace, we definitely, I like when the interviewer talks about it and brings it up first, they start the conversation. It's not based off of me wanting to ask, what are their diversity numbers? I'm very impressed by employers who are able to come to the table and openly discuss it and are eager and not waiting for a question to be asked about what their staff are. Uh, something that I have seen it often in the jo co-op job search so far, but it's only probably about in 25% of job applications that I see any mention of diversity at all, even if it's one line or if it's mentioned in the interview or anything along those lines. As someone who is studying in sports, and today is National Women in Sport Day, I definitely feel very passionate about females being in um, industries that are underrepresented by females. So something like that definitely draws a candidate like myself to a role when they state that there are opportunities for me to grow and learn, especially by female mentors. Great. Thank you, Katie. Now that we've talked um, about equity and diversity in the recruitment phase, let's talk about how organizations can attract the right candidates. So a recent study published by the WorkLearn team was based on an experiment with students to understand what stood out to them in job advertisements and led them to be more interested in a role and more interested in spending time preparing an application. Uh, we controlled for factors such as location, pay, and job title. And we found that when students were given a description that included statements related to these three areas, students were more likely to express interest in the role and indicate they would spend more time preparing an application. Students were looking to the job posting for signals that the job would offer them opportunities to learn, to make an impact, and to link their academics or career interests to the work. Following that study, we turned to our Waterloo Works job posting database and the fantastic data analytics team we have to see if similar results would be found in actual student application behaviors. What we found was job postings that included keywords related to company culture, as Katie mentioned, employer values, programming languages, uh, food and games, and compensation were likely to receive more job applications from students. Interestingly, also at the top of that list were postings that included wording about career development opportunities, which would be consistent with the findings from our job posting experiment. In one of, our in one of today's breakout sessions after this main presentation, the, entitled What Drives Student Interest in Your Job, we'll dig deeper into this area and share ways that organizations can improve job attractiveness through their job descriptions. Now I'd like to ask Jeff to comment on how Curve Grid attracts a strong pool of candidates and any advice that he has for other organizations in doing so. Jeff? Thank you, Judy. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's been an interesting year, and I think a lot has changed for, for many organizations, uh, ourselves included. Um, so, you know, some of this is through the lens of pre uh, COVID 19. Some of it uh, is, is, I think, very relatable to what we're going through uh, uh, now as well and, and, and much more generally. So, you know, for us being a, a, a Tokyo based employer, uh, it's all about location, 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 right? And in the past, we've certainly brought um, uh, co op students out to Japan, and that has been a huge draw and allowed us to compete. I think very effectively with employers, uh, for example, um, you know, in the in the in the San Francisco Bay Area or uh, you know other other kinds of um, uh, locations uh, like that. Um, I think that uh, actually in the past year, um, although we haven't been hiring uh, UW Co-op students from UW Co-op, we have continued to hire interns, and uh, some of those have been actually all of them really have been. Uh, remotely and our advantage being in the Asia Pacific time zone means that uh, you know it can be very uh, um, uh, I guess attractive to students that are on this side of the world 
But I think that that could certainly be true, um, uh, you know, uh, in Canada, right? Like you can think beyond just sort of the North American East Coast or maybe West Coast time zone uh, to maybe to Europe or even to Asia, right? And, uh, you know, for us in the past with some projects, that's given us a very good uh, 24 by 7 coverage. Um, and, and so, you know, very effective uh, that way. In terms of organization size, you know, this applies on both ends of the spectrum. So we're a tiny organization, right? Uh, or, or, or a small startup. Um, what that means is that, um, you know, it's not just a flat organization that, that we can talk about, but we're really, I mean, everybody has has very, has very incredible access to everyone else in the organization, whether you're, you're a, um, a co-op student or, or, you know, one of our, our full-time engineers. And uh, that allows us to, um, uh, you know, provide just incredible access, I think, to opportunities that, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily uh, be there otherwise. And I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, in terms of uh, the tangible and tangible benefits, so, um, uh, you know, to Katie's point, we definitely do put all of these on the job posting, right? And uh, uh, in terms of a salary, uh, we offer a relocation we pay uh, for and, uh, um, and arrange a relocation, um, a housing, a transit pass, uh, and we also offer co students vacation days, which I think what we've heard is is uh, unique. Uh, we haven't heard of any other employers uh, offering something like that. Certainly when students come out to Japan, we want to give them an opportunity to explore uh, uh, here. Uh, but I think that that's the kind of uh, uh, the sorts of benefits that you, uh, you know, we can use to attract uh, a high, very high quality talent. In terms of the intangible benefits and coming back to something I said earlier, uh, you know, as an organization at our size, uh, we give our co-op students the opportunity to participate in external customer meetings. Um, you know, we we uh, are as transparent as we can be about the inner workings of the business. Like, what if they want to start a company someday? Um, we allow them to, you know, run a meeting, for example. Um, and even if you're in a large organization, these may seem a, a little bit less accessible, but there's things that you can do within your team, right? Uh, you know, allow a, a junior employee or an intern to to run the meeting for the week, right? Or or allow them to do some some um, uh, allow them to join a, a meeting with with another team. So again, we spell this all out in the job posting. I think it's very important uh, both in the interview as well as through the um, uh, um, the the entire work term. Uh, for co-op students to really engage in a dialogue uh, to not only provide feedback but also seek feedback right if if uh, you know how are we doing as a company or even during the interview process um, you know how is the how did the interview go uh, how can we do better um, and um, uh, for candidates that turn us down you know why did you turn us down and 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 what can we do better in the future um, so I think that that focusing on, on on your strengths in all of these kinds of areas is something that's been a very positive and successful for us. Wonderful. And uh, uh, speaking of 24 7, we greatly appreciate, Jeff, that you're joining us very late in the evening, um, your time. Um, Dr. Momani, I'm wondering if you could comment on what organizations can be doing to ensure they're supporting equal opportunities in the recruitment process and within their organizations. Yeah, thank you. So I think that. One of the things, um, and, and really following up uh, very nicely on what has been said already, is that you know you really need to sort of be conscious of this. And one of the things and approaches that I always know that really needs to be done is in taking your organization and measuring diversity. Um, and it's really important because you also will be surprised to what you find, right? And, and thinking about uh, also where your problems lie. Sometimes we find, for example, uh, the, the, the problem may lie on the factory floor, so to speak, but not in head office. And, and if you're in head office and see diversity around you, you think, oh, we don't have a problem in our company, but then at the shop floor you do, or vice versa. And so I think it's really important to do this very systematically, thinking about proportionality. Uh, of course, gender, one that I'm very passionate about is a really important one, you know, 52% of the population. Uh, it's statistically impossible to have the fact that we do today you know, there are more, you know, CEOs named John in Fortune 500 than there are all women combined, more Davids than all women combined. Again, 52% of the population. So there's a real challenge. And when you don't measure it, when you don't do the kinds of uh, evaluation of your own workforce, you don't know where the problem lies. And I think you start to become really shocked 
Uh, when 25% of our population in Canada is racialized, when we know that, you know, 5% of our population are Black Canadians, uh, and so forth. And, and take a look and see if, you know, you're, you're measuring up, so to speak. Um, one thing that can be done, I think this is also, um, can be done in many different companies, certainly governments are thinking about this as well, is how do you bring diversity and inclusion in the procurement process? So this is, an, this is an opportunity, really, to not just think about your workforce, but who are you doing business with? Um, are you making requirements on the fact that you actually want to also deal with other companies that are diverse? Uh, now, of course, that doesn't always work everywhere. I mean, if you're signing a deal with a manufacturer in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is not necessarily a multicultural country, so that doesn't apply. But, you know, as we think about this in terms of supply chains, and increasingly we are looking at, you know, American and Canadian markets, what are they doing? What is What are their EDI policies? How are they, you know, working at this? And and I've seen some very interesting uh, opportunities, even to, as, as, as high level as law firms, who actually have clients that put in their, uh, their service agreement that they want to ensure that the lawyers that are working on their uh, company have to be diverse and have to prove it. So that is really important. I think that's an, a really powerful incentive to ensure um, that we diverse, uh, hire diversely. The other thing that we can do is think about culture, uh, corporate culture. Uh, and this is really important because if you just stop at uh, the inclusion and diversity, but don't really, or start the diversity, not think about the inclusion, then you're not doing an effective job at making sure that you retain that talent. Uh, that diverse talent. We know that racialized individuals um, do tend to leave corporations earlier, particularly when those corporations have a corporate culture that aren't necessarily inclusive. So what are you doing to foster that? There's no point in hiring diverse if your entire corporate culture continues to be, frankly, work against all those great, um, those great targets. So thinking about what is your corporate culture? How do people self-identify? What are the values? Um, what are your complaint mechanisms. Um, how are you ensuring that you know discrimination and, and racism and sexism, uh, homophobia isn't in, you know embedded in your organization? What can you do to ensure that you really live by it? And I think having frankly carrots and sticks, it's not just about uh, increasingly just about the incentives. You can do a lot of bias training and all that great stuff, but are you also punishing those that frankly are doing harm uh, to you, to your workers and to your brand? Thank you, Besma. Those are really important um, factors for us to consider and think about and, and some really practical strategies, I think, for, for moving that work forward. Thank you. Matthew, you've had a number of co-op experiences, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the key features that would attract you or classmates to a job opportunity. Yeah, of course. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Matthew. I'm uh, entering my fourth year of uh, political science and business at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I'm actually in a co-op term right now, but also applying to roles as well uh, for the summer term. So this is actually super relevant because it's been something that I've been thinking about a lot in the last few weeks. Um, so I think for things that attract me to roles and specifically uh, sort of three things that I look for. First, um, roles and responsibilities of that position. Um, as Jeff was mentioning, um, he sort of talked a little bit about intangible benefits. To me personally, that's something that I kind of really look for. Um, and that's the ability to, you know, run meetings and to take on interesting tasks and to be present sort of in um, decision-making processes for things. And even if it's not a big organizational wide uh, decision-making process, but, you know, feeling a part of that team and being able to actually um, you know, work with that team and, and have some interesting roles and responsibilities. Uh, I think second, um, projects that allow me to accomplish meaningful work um, are things that I look for. And, and um, it's something that I, I love to see spelled out in a job posting um, because as any other co-op student knows, there is any employer who's kind of looked through Waterloo Works um, it's important to have, you know, a very descriptive, well-written job posting because there's so many that students are applying for. Um, so something that is evil, you know, sorry, easy to to kind of read and sort of bangs out all of this information and says right on it, here are some projects that you can accomplish. Here are some things that will allow you to do meaningful work. That's important. Um, and as such, being able to actually carry out those things on a work term is so important. I know lots of students who went to work for different companies thinking that it was going to be an interesting experience and then really spent most of the time doing kind of menial tasks and, and not really anything interesting. And despite it perhaps being an industry that they may have continued to work in otherwise, 
um, sort of the lack of the availability of doing meaningful work prevented them from ever wanting to actually apply and you know look for jobs with that firm or that industry again. Um, and I think third um, is sort of the availability of mentorship and of learning. And that's access to, to people who have experience in those industries, or I guess have lots of experience within um, sort of the work um, environment there. And that's the ability to learn from them and to sort of dig into the work that they're doing um, and to get some you know, leadership on the stuff that you're doing as well. Um, so for me, those are the important things that I look for. I love those intangible benefits um, because I use co-op as a way to you know, figure out what I want to do. I, I want to try things and see if I like them and see if I don't like them. And that's sort of how I've decided where to apply next and, you know, decided what I want to do after school. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I look for. Great, thank you. Um, it's it's always uh, rewarding and, and reassuring when I hear students speak about um, their experiences and it aligns with the, the research that we do. So thank you for, for sharing that. I also um, was intrigued by your comments about what would make a, a student want to return later. And one of the one of the sessions we'll have in this series happening over 2021 is on conversion. So, you know, what is the experience you can provide to your students during their internship or co-op that's going to make them interested in, in coming back to your organization? So thanks, thanks for touching on that as well. Um, the last section for today's um, presentation is on strengthening remote recruitment strategies. Uh, we conducted a study in back in May with co-op students who had made the transition from working in person to working remotely in mid-March, like many of us did. Uh, in interviews with them, we asked them about the skills that they felt were most important for their success in transitioning to remote work. And these are the words that they used. Communication was at the top of the list, referenced most frequently. And when students spoke about it, they talked about how the nature of communication had changed and the importance of communication channels being open to continue to be productive and, and contributing. They also spoke about the importance of self-direction, time management, and adaptability as all being more critical than ever before for them to be successful at work. They also noted a new level of importance for initiative, something that they felt had always been important as a co-op student, but in the remote working environment, it was too easy to become invisible. And so even more initiative was needed in order to reach out and meet people in the organization and to offer to help with additional projects or, or tasks. Based on that research that we did with students about the changing nature of what seemed to be needed for success in a remote work environment, we turned to our database of job postings to see whether there were changes starting to emerge in job postings for remote roles. We examined the words in job postings from fall 2019 and compared them to the job postings from fall 2020, and we did find some differences. First, you'll notice that there are a number of references to online tools that emerged for the first time, including Zoom and WebEx. But there was also a notable increase in the usage of words related to skills students spoke about in their research interviews with us time management, resilience, uncertainty, volatile, adapt, juggle. So it seems that the skills needed to navigate remote work already appear to have become part of the language used to recruit applicants. Jeff, you've been recruiting remotely for CurveGrid uh, prior to the pandemic. I wonder if you can share some tips with us on hiring strategies. Yeah, thank you, uh, Judine. Um, so yeah, a little bit of background. We started hiring uh, not remotely. We started hiring uh, by flying the 14 hours from Tokyo to uh, you know Pearson and the the one and a half hour drive to Waterloo and and spending you know a couple of days, you know, uh, um, in in the co-op building, uh, just going through uh, uh, in person uh, interviews. And you know, for us, it was sort of out of necessity that um, you know. Uh, we we wanted to make that process more efficient for us, and so uh, I guess uh, um, maybe two uh, years ago we we basically moved that entire process online, and and 
uh, you know, we were at a point where we weren't meeting our co-op students uh, for the first time until they they showed up at the office on 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 Monday morning after uh, having having flown uh, to Tokyo. So, you know, I think for us, um, uh, I could talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the specific strategies there and then also the broader themes that have really helped us. Uh, obviously, we do everything we can with technology. Uh, we've gotten, um, you know, very good at um, uh, Zoom interviews and making use, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, online uh, uh, programming uh, at, at challenges. So both uh, ones that the students do automatically, and, and maybe there's an analog to different to other industries as well, uh, as well as then uh, uh, basically screen sharing and, 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 and working through that almost kind of like a virtual uh, uh, whiteboarding or virtual uh, programming um, session. We certainly make sure that we are having multiple conversations with the students, potentially across uh, different mediums as well. Uh, so not just through video interviews, but email, uh, LinkedIn conversations. And, and that uh, kind of leads me into, you know, the broader strategy of building a pipeline and be, being proactive. And, and we're at a very good place right now where actually most of our, our interest in CurveGrid is, uh, is inbound and, and referrals. And, you know, coming back to many of the other, uh, um, uh, uh, some of the other points I mentioned earlier as well, right, where it's that constant uh, communication, the fact that students talk to one another, uh, um, you know, has really uh, just helped uh, make our, our whole hiring process um, a lot more, um, uh, a lot more efficient. It is uh, 2021 and, you know, some of those, those, those words in the, 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 the new words, the lexicon of recruiting that Judine mentioned in the previous slide, you know, around Zoom and WebEx and other uh, remote technologies, um, you know, have made, have meant that um, we can do a lot more, but we may not be able to, uh, it may not work out for everyone, right? And then, um, uh, you know, I, I, that certainly could be could be uh, true for, for um, other organizations as well. I think that, you know, if there's not something that we can offer now in terms of a, a co-op position, can we genuinely offer uh, something uh, in, in the future, right? Uh, or, 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 or come back to, to an opportunity in the future. And I think that again goes back to that that follow up and that and that uh, communication, I would say, you know, the, the, the kind of final two messages here um, are uh, for any organization. Don't be afraid to look globally. Right. I talked a little bit earlier about the advantages of different time zones and the advantages, of course, of uh, global diverse uh, perspectives. And I think that that, uh, you know, now more than ever, we really need to be uh, creative and, and adapt. And for us at CurveGrid, it was a necessity not wanting to to um, you know, make that that 14 hour flight or find a way to kind of optimize that. But I think, you know, um, uh, as as the last year has taught us all uh, that uh, that, uh, you know, we we may be able to adapt in our organizations may be able to adapt in ways that we we didn't think possible for. And, and really, um, you know, even though we are part uh, that, that we can all come together with that. Great, great suggestions. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. So I think it's it's clear um, that COVID-19 has accelerated organizations capacity for su more supporting a remote workforce and, and for tapping into a global talent pool. Uh, Dr. Momani, I wonder if you could share your thoughts with us on the impacts of remote work, particularly as it relates to underrepresented groups. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is something I'm finding very interesting and I've been following just out of great interest is thinking about what are the benefits? Uh, I mean, there's challenges without a doubt. I'm certainly not enjoying it, personally speaking, and I'm sure many others aren't. Uh, but this might just bring some opportunities. And I think for recruitment and thinking about, you know, the workforce of the future, because uh, I'm sure there is going to be some sort of hybrid model before us. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back uh, to the way things were. Um, as an academic, I'd argue even everything from the environment to increased concerns about, you know, work-life balance, there's going to be more receptivity to the idea of having uh, remote work. So what, what are the opportunities? Well, think about this, right? We're, we're not limited by location. So this means we can hire talent outside of core cities, expensive cities. Uh, there's maybe an opportunity to think about, you know, hiring from rural areas, low income areas, uh, particularly when commuting is prohibitive. We all know Toronto is a very expensive city. Vancouver is a very expensive city. Um, and it can, it can include new time zones. Um, and that's actually very interesting for productivity. Uh, what, what happens if, for example, you do think about, let's say, international recruitment, where you might have a workforce that works on one shift that you know is carried 
um, you know, carry over into the next shift, uh, taking advantage of different time zones. So you're constantly being productive. That's really, really interesting. Um, and one really interesting example that I was following uh, in Washington, D.C., as you noted, I, I belong to a D.C. think tank, is that actually this year, um, on 2020, they found it was the most diverse um, recruitment of uh, interns they'd ever seen. And that's partly because Washington is a very expensive city and a lot of uh, you know, visual minorities or racialized individuals can't afford to live in Washington, D.C. to take advantage of these wonderful internship opportunities. So one of the great things we found is actually this was the most diverse uh, cohort. And that just shows that there's really some prohibitive aspects of, you know, work isn't all a level playing field, the recruitment isn't all a level playing field, and that there for some people real challenges. Um, also, women and caregivers, we know that this is potentially going to open a lot of opportunities. Um, I think a lot of women who do have young children in particular or other caregivers, um, you know, find the idea of, you know, working past uh, a certain hour very difficult to find uh, daycare options or after school care options. Um, this might just provide that kind of flexibility. Um, you can see where this would open up opportunities in the semi-retired um, community. I think there are many uh, individuals who don't want to work, uh, you know, let's say full time post 65 and beyond. Uh, maybe they're snowbirds who want to have an opportunity to still, you know, still be engaged in the workplace, but not necessarily have to be in the office nine to five every day. So you can just start to see some really interesting opportunities. The other thing, um, and this has really been borne out during this uh, crisis, has been the disabled community, um, where again, for all the you know, we hope to think that we have equitable workplaces that are completely accessible. I can tell you, unfortunately, there are still many, many barriers uh, to people with physical challenges. Um, but it's not just physical challenges. We also find actually increasingly uh, autistic workers. Um, you know, autistic people have enormous talent. Um, their ability to be so uh, attentive to find detail, uh, but they don't necessarily enjoy the social uh, aspects of an office. And so remote work can actually be very liberating for them. They're able to be very productive, but there isn't the same kind of pressure of having that, you know, that office environment. So there's lots of opportunities here. I think, again, as we start to wrap our heads around this future, we do have to think about that. I think remote work is going to, to stay with us. It'll be a hybrid, certainly. But now that we've done it, now that we've all kind of overcome the, the intellectual barrier, if you will, um, to doing it and see, yeah, it works. It's not great for some people, but for others, it might be wonderful. And that might actually be a great opportunity to really diversify your workforce. Thank you, Besma. The, those are uh, excellent uh, examples of, of it not just being, uh, looking at COVID as a, as a challenging and um, negatively disruptive force, uh, in, instead looking at, at what opportunities it may have created. So thank you. Uh, Katie and Matthew, I'd like to uh, turn it over to you. You've both experienced a remote uh, recruitment environment. Katie, can you tell us a little bit about what you found most challenging about the remote job search and interview process and maybe how you've overcome those challenges? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Judine. So I found that with COVID-19 impacting the job search process for myself, it's the networking aspect of it. So not being able to have coffee chats or attend those networking events that foster the organic relationships with recruiters or companies and to really see fit if that company or that team is giving me the right feeling that it'll, it'll be a good match for the term. Um, that's really difficult to not be able to have those organic relationships being made and interactions. Every time that there was an event at the co-op center they, hosted by a company, it was definitely super beneficial to have that interaction with recruiters. So they don't only see you as a cover letter and as a piece of paper, but also that they're truly investing in their future candidates and employees by wanting to get to know us on another level and maintain that relationship. So some ways that I've mitigated the challenges that this has ha happened with COVID, um, 10,000 Coffees is a great platform that I've met up with other U Waterloo alumni and have been able to chat and talk to them about their career journey and what companies that they're currently working for. LinkedIn is still one of my favorites for connecting and 
trying to figure out if the organization is a good fit or speaking to certain recruiters. I definitely think pre-COVID times and post-COVID, I'm very, very excited to have the opportunity to attend networking events again. Um, my experience with Scotiabank is one that I definitely have to highlight because two years ago, I met them at the Co-op Tatum Center for an event because in their application, they actually highly encouraged you to attend the event when they were on campus so that they could get to know their candidates. An example like that of an organization really showing that they care about who they're hiring and the whole person that they are bringing to the team meant a lot. And I guess that speaks as to why I'm having now a one-year contract with them and then also just finished a four-month term with them as well. So yeah, I think it's definitely just the natural human interaction. Zoom calls are great, but um, we'll definitely love the day that <laughs> you can go for a Starbucks chat with somebody and sit together in person. Yeah, those are fantastic points. And I think it it sort of really speaks to you never really want to. It's less than ideal to kind of roll the dice and not know exactly what you're getting into. So um, likewise, I, I think the same things. And I think, um, I don't know if Judy wanted to jump in or is it OK if I just keep going? OK, um, so I think it just in terms of, you know, how I feel about this, um, I'm a very social person. I, I really love in-person interaction and I love to meet people in person. Um, and I think that's kind of where I excel the most in terms of interviews and being able to meet, uh, you know, recruiters and network and all sorts of different stuff. So for me, feeling comfortable in virtual environments, um, virtual interviews and all of that kind of stuff was definitely a bit of an adjustment and it was kind of a leap to to sort of where I wanted to reach. Um, so, you know, um, you know, being able to to adjust and practice um, was something that I found a little bit diff difficult um, and also really having to rely a lot on articulating um, the things that I'm good at and the really specific skills that I have, uh, you know, in regards to my previous job experiences um, in a way that um, exemplified them so that I was relying less on, you know, body language and free flowing conversation because I feel that that environment isn't really the same, obviously. So being mindful to those and practicing and being sure I know exactly sort of the things that I want to say um, are sort of the strategies that I've used. Wonderful. Thank you to you both. As we uh, wrap up today's session and move into questions and answers, I, I just wanted to highlight three key takeaways. Uh, we hope that today's session has helped you think about recruitment from a few different perspectives. One, the importance of a focus on equity, diversity and inclusion and the importance of actions matching words. The second, the importance of being open with candidates about your organization's culture, values, and the work that they could expect to be doing, which can be incorporated into job postings or part of the interview process. And lastly, thinking more broadly about what your ideal candidate might be and what they will need to manage in a remote working environment. And now I'd like to say thank you very much to our guest speakers for their contributions today. Um, here's some information on this slide about staying connected with us. We'll be sharing the recording uh, with any and the slides with anyone who registered for today's session. Uh, that will help you uh, know how to get in, in touch with us. And a couple of additional notes. Uh, we are building an employer resource hub on the WorkLearn website and the first section of the site was launched last week and it has tips and tricks targeting uh, the area of recruitment. You can find that, as I mentioned, on the Work Learn website. The second thing is we have launched a newsletter that will contain information about our latest research and information about upcoming events. You can sign up for the newsletter visiting the website as well. And you'll also note on this slide, the next online event in this series is going to be held on April 28th at 12 noon Eastern time and will be focused on a topic of engaging. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you is that following today's portion of, of this event, there will be three breakout sessions where you can learn more specifics about the topics we've covered today in recruitment. We have one on co-op recruitment fundamentals uh, for small business employers and startups. We have another on how to finance your co-op hires and a third on looking into what's driving interest in your jobs. If you'd like to join one of those sessions, we'll have the links in the chat that you'll be able to follow to um, participate in those sessions. And uh, once again, a, a big thank you to 
our guests today and to you for joining us.